We will go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody who is joining us tonight. Um, our topic for tonight is um, Dr. Z's top 10 skincare tips. So these are a few of my favorite um, recommendations. Anybody who knows me knows I'm always sort of um, talking about these things on a daily basis. So, Okay, this is just um, a, a review and overall of um, everything we're going to talk about. The first one, um, as any self-respecting dermatologist would agree, is um, sunscreen. So absolutely, um, sunscreen is um, the number one most important thing that we can do to protect our skin. Uh, we know that exposure to UV radiation can lead to skin cancer. And um, we also know that sun damage is the number one cause of wrinkles and discoloration. So, um, okay. And uh, we do have evidence for this. So uh, we actually have proof that the sun, you know, ages the skin. We always um, sort of knew this, but it's always great to have uh, the data to support it. There was a couple of studies done not so long ago proving that regular sunscreen use prevents aging of the skin. And that is daily sunscreen use. So different from the type of application that you do when you go to the beach. But uh, putting sunscreen on your face on a daily basis is actually preventing um, photo aging. And um, because a picture speaks a thousand words, uh, one of my favorites is this truck driver who happened to walk into a clinic at, in Northwestern actually in um, 2012. And he became famous because he demonstrated this um, very well. Uh, as you can see, the left side of his face um, has was obviously the sun, the side that was facing the window for you know many many years and he looked significantly older on the left versus the right just to continue along with this is that um these twins so these are actually twin sisters that uh just kind of help us drive home this point uh the one on the left um obviously looks older she uh lived in florida um the one on the right um, I believe lived um, in, in um, the Midwest. And so it had significantly less sun exposure over the course of her life. This is sort of a perfect science experiment since we um, can compare two genetically equal individuals. Um, and the last sort of example I will give, uh, which I think is an important one, is this, um, this was an office worker who for many years, um, sat next to a window. And whereas the truck driver on occasion would have the window open, this person obviously sat next to a window that did not open. And um, it, it just goes to show that the UVA does go through glass. So um, we do need sunscreen, even when we're indoors, even when we're driving. Um, so sunscreen, sunscreen on the face every day. And um, so every day, as I was saying, even if it's cloudy, even if it's raining or if there's snow, um, it's important to wear sunscreen. Some of those cloudy or snowy days are actually the most dangerous because we don't feel the sun. Um, so um, it's important to, to um, apply it on those days as well. Applying it liberally, of course. And I do get this question as to whether or not the sunscreen and makeup is enough. For the most part, it is not. And that's because we don't put on, you know, a thick layer of makeup every day. Um, what you want to look for is something that says broad spectrum, SPF 30 or higher. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about sunscreen because they are sort of hot topics. Um, because it is important, I get the question, you know, which one should I use? And it tends to end up being a personal decision. It's important to be able to 
um, as with all skincare products, read the ingredients and see what it is that you are applying. So the main differences here are that if you are using a chemical sunscreen, um, it's gonna be one of these um, ingredients that's labeled in green. The mineral sunscreens are sort of easier to remember because it's zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Um, so basically, if you're looking for mineral, look for the zinc or the titanium, everything else is going to be a chemical sunscreen. And this is, um, show, you know, goes to show that just like you read ingredients and you look at food products, you want to look for the above the line ingredients here. Here's where you're going to see your actives. Um, you're going to either see, you know, zinc or titanium, or you'll see some of the chemical ingredients and you know, look for broad spectrum on the front of the bottle. And this is according to a recent um, rule that was made by the FDA. So you know, it looks a little jumbled at first, but really these are the two things you have to look for when you're looking for a sunscreen. Okay. So um, in terms of the favorites, um, there's many, many options that are available now. And uh, that's, that's what I love about um, sharing this information with my patients is teaching them how to look for what they wanna see on the bottle. I'm a big fan of the tinted mineral sunscreens um, and they come in so many different shades now. The daily moisturizer products that have sunscreen in them are great for putting on the face on a daily basis. Um, there are sheer mineral products and there are powders that you can use for reapplication throughout the day. The important thing, like I said before, is to look for the ingredients and, um, and then pick a product that you like. And that is because, you know, obviously the best sunscreen is the one that you will use. Um, if I don't like a product, then I'm unlikely to put it on. I'm unlikely to be good about applying it every day. So um, that's what's great about all the options out there. So moving on to number two, which is somewhat related to number one, um, is uh, still on my sun protection soapbox, is the sun protective clothing that is available now. It just really helps with um, part of you know, your sun protection plan. If you are at the beach or at the pool, or if you are even outdoors, if you're having a meal outside, eating eating you know, lunch or dinner even, um, you can get caught and, and those are the times that people tend to get sunburned. So it's great to look for these products that have a rating on them of UPF 50 plus. These products don't have any chemicals in them. They just basically guarantee you that the weave of the fabric is tight enough that it's gonna protect your skin from the sun. Um, and there's different products that are available for you know, staying dry and for going in the water. So um, lots of options out there. And it has obviously become trendy to sun protect. So this is all working in our favor in terms of what ends up being available um, for sun protection. Okay, moving on to um, one of the most favorite uh, um, anti-aging products that are available out there um, are these vitamin A derivatives, more commonly known as retinols. So retinols are actually only part of, part of the product line that's available, um, but they, that just happens to be the word that is most um, recognized. These vitamin A derivatives are um, sort of the, the workhorse in terms of keeping your skin um, youthful and without um, signs of aging um, in a natural way, of course. So they stimulate cell turnover and exfoliation they help the um, sort of dead skin cells um, come off and that you know, allows new, new cells to develop. There are studies that prove that they increase collagen production in the skin. So that's, that's part of why these are so widely recommended and that's because they, um, we do have evidence for this as well. So with you know, prolonged use, they, they minimize fine lines and they even out the skin tone, which you know, many people are surprised to find out um, that uneven skin tone is actually um, a bigger sign of aging than, than actually having fine lines. 
So studies have shown that people who have an uneven skin tone are actually considered to be older than people who have more wrinkles on their face. Uh, lots of ingredients to look out for. There are over-the-counter versions, which include retinol, retinol palmitate, retinaldehyde, and adapalene, which is recently available over-the-counter. And then we have the stronger prescription versions like tretinoin, or historically known as Retin-A, which is the um, brand name, and adapalene, tazarotene, and triferotene. So these are all going to be um, available by prescription. The reason that adapalene is here as well is because we do have a version that is available by prescription. The key with these medications is to use them properly. And I spend a lot of my time educating my patients as to how to properly use them because these tools are readily available and um, it's not so much a secret which products are effective. It's more about incorporating them properly into your skincare regimen. So um, many of my patients said, I can't use that. You know, it's too irritating or that gave me a rash or whatnot. And many times we'll try again. I'll say, listen, try it the way I'm saying to use it, same exact product, and then they'll get much better results. So these vitamin A derivatives should be applied at night. It should be a very thin layer of medication. Um, you can see I'm getting some feedback. Some, some people here are saying that I'm getting some feedback when I speak. Um, I'm gonna try to move closer to the microphone a little bit. Okay, so um, we're gonna use a thin layer of these medications and um, build a tolerance. So that means you don't gob it on all over the face immediately up front. Um, we use, you know, every other day, every third day, you basically very slowly get your skin acclimated to this process of exfoliation. And um, as you build tolerance, you can use it more and more frequently, um, working up to nightly if possible. Here are a couple of my favorite um, entry-level retinoids. The first one being Differin Gel, which is so great that now it's you know, readily available over the counter. Um, and uh, you're gonna find it in the acne treatment section of you know, your local pharmacy. Um, and then for something that is um, a, a little bit even gentler than the adapalene. I like this product by Aven. It's called Retrinol. Um, they have a 0 0.1 and I believe a 0 0.05. So these are both like very gentle, usually well tolerated products. Um, and what you can do is as you get used to using one of these products, then you know work up to something stronger. Okay. So those are the retinoids. We talked about sunscreen, we talked about retinoids. This is sort of the next um, product type that's in the armamentarium of um, anti-aging and keeping the skin looking healthy are the antioxidants. Um, so just a little bit of science here. Basically free radicals are all the bad guys that cause cell damage to our skin. Um, they cause cell damage, which then, you know, causes aging of the skin. Um, these are, you know, not only created by the sun, by pollution, by um, other, you know, elements that our skin encounters. Antioxidants basically neutralize these free radicals. And in doing so, they protect the cells. Um, I have this fun cartoon that I found, which I think is a great explanation of what they're actually doing. Here are our healthy skin cells. Here are the angry evil free radicals. And what the antioxidants do is they prevent these free radicals from doing what they wanna to do to the cell. So they actually you know, um, change the chemical structure of the, of the free radicals. And we have lots of studies that demonstrate you know, their positive effects, um, not just on the skin, but on other you know, parts of the body, um, having an anti-inflammatory effect. So um, there's good data for this as well. Where do we find these antioxidants? The antioxidants um, 
you know, are, are obviously found in fruits, vegetables, um, things like seeds, nuts, green tea, I'm sure many people have heard about, has tons of antioxidants, red wine is a favorite. Um, so the question is, can we, we know that eating them can be healthy and can be helpful, but does it work to put them on top of the skin? And the answer is yes, but that you do need to do it in a somewhat educated fashion because the concentration you know, of these products, the stability and the penetrability, meaning can the antioxidants get to where they need to go in the skin, um, you know, all of this varies depending on the product. So I'm gonna give you a few tips as to what to look for. Um, vitamin C is the most common antioxidant that is applied on the skin. There are some others that are starting to become popular as well, but I'm going to focus on vitamin C because it's, um, it's a biggie. Um, there's different forms of vitamin C. It's a very unstable product, and so it, you know, it can be it's an unstable chemical, I should say. And um, depending on you know, the, um, the formulation, it can either be stable or unstable. So we have ascorbic acid. We have another one called THD ascorbate, is sort of the nickname for the tetrahexyl vessel. Um, THD is the easier way to remember it. Um, both of them are, are, are relatively unstable when they're exposed to air and light. So the, the first thing that you should look for when you're looking for vitamin C serum or cream is the tube should be opaque. Um, so either it should be like a um, foil print tube, or it should be in one of these air restrictive bottles. Um, sometimes it's a pump where it sort of, you know, like gets rid of the air as it goes, as you pump it up. Um, that's the first and most important thing to look for. Um, here I have one, one example, this sort of cult favorite skin suitables product um, is a very good one. And as you can see, the bottle is made of dark glass. Um, this one happens to be a dropper. And so even this, I would recommend that somebody store in their medicine cabinet. You know, you take it out, you use it, you, you know, close it back up, put it in, and then close the medicine cabinet just because um, you really want to protect that antioxidant. Um, there are great options available now, so much so that it can be a little bit overwhelming at times, I would say. Okay. Let me, let's see, I'm getting lots of concerns about this sound. I'm going to try one thing. Bear with me for one more minute. I'm going to try to fix this. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, Dr. Zepolanski, I think that sounds better. Is that better? Okay. All right, guys. So here I am with my earphones. Um, okay, we will keep going. So um, great. I'm sorry that I wasn't like this the whole time. Okay, all right. 
So here are the examples of the vitamin C products. Um, as I was saying, there's lots of options out there and it can be a little bit overwhelming. So um, what's important, the first thing to look for is like I said, these crimp tubes, right? Even this drugstore product, L'Oreal, 10% um, vitamin C. The good thing about this is that it is in a crimp tube and um, it's gonna be protected from the light. Same thing with this Paula's Choice product. It's a pump, um, it's gonna be well protected. Some of the other products that maybe look like they have more, you know, they let some of the light in are going to be mixed with some acid, which can make it more stable, um, but um, a little bit more irritating. So this is definitely okay if you have, um, if you don't have sensitive skin. Um, this example over here of the revision product is that tetrahexyl, the THD, I should say, um, version of the vitamin C. And so um, that uh, it, it's a little bit more of a pricey product, but it's that more stable version um, and it's going to be better for sensitive skin. So, okay. Moving away from some of those skincare products um, that are you know, usually part of the regimen, I'm gonna give a few other tips that just tend to be my favorites. Um, if anybody has seen those, those movies, like My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where they have put Windex on everything, in my house, you will know that Vaseline gets applied to basically anything on the skin. And that is because we have great studies that show um, that moist um, skin heals much better than dry skin. And with not only less pain, but much less scarring. So, um, so basically for wound care of, of anything that's not infected, cuts, scrapes, um, and even, you know, uh, it can be healing pimples on the face, that sort of thing. Um, anything that would otherwise form a scab, keeping Vaseline on it is going to, um, just going to have it heal in a much better way. So um, those are my favorites. And this is the original paper. It was, you know, this was proved way back in the 70s. Um, and we, it really changed um, the way we take care of wounds today. So Vaseline, many times a day, I'm saying Vaseline, not Neosporin, because um, Neosporin is actually, um, can be an allergen. So many people use Neosporin and don't have any issue with it, but, um, but it can create an allergic reaction. And so um, it, uh, it, it's not great if you're trying to heal a wound and then also having some irritation. If you do just really like to put antibiotic on a wound or on cuts and scrapes, I would recommend polysporin instead of neosporin. It has one less antibiotic in it. Um, it does not have the neomycin, which neosporin does, which is the main culprit. Um, these are uh, you know, substitutes for Vaseline that are perfectly fine. Uh, the CeraVe or the Aquaphor ointments, I sort of refer to them as fancy Vaseline, um, but they do exactly the same thing. And sometimes they just feel a little um, better on the skin. Okay, so we do not need alcohol. We do not need hydrogen peroxide. Um, it is okay to use these products, um, you know, immediately to clean out a wound that might be dirty. Um, but for wound care, things like these, these hydrogen peroxide and alcohol, they get rid of healthy tissue in addition to, um, you know, any bacteria that might be there. So um, we, we, we don't need these for regular wound care. And then once the wound is healed and we have a cut or scrape that has left a mark on the skin, um, the only um, treatment that we have for scars, topical treatment that has good science behind it are the silicone containing products. So um, they have gels, we have strips, we have bandages. These are now readily available. I mean, it used to be difficult and I would have to refer patients online to order these products. These are so, I mean, readily available. You can either get the brand name, Scar Away, or you know, these larger silicone sheets um, 
that uh, you just stick on and prevent scars from um, bubbling up. Uh, this can actually also prevent scars from becoming itchy or painful as well. And the data shows that you can do this even years out. So this works on old scars as well. Vitamin E oil is not necessary. Um, vitamin E does not have any evidence for helping you know, with scarring. And you do run the risk of a contact dermatitis to vitamin E, um, you know, which is the same as putting Neosporin on a wound and you know, having some kind of inflammation going on at the same time that you're trying to heal the skin. Okay. Um, anybody who's ever met me knows that compression stockings are one of my favorite, favorite articles of clothing. Um, they are um, wonderful for preventing varicose veins, for treating varicose veins, preventing swelling, um, which can lead to rashes on the skin. Um, and I think for you know, any activity that requires lots of, you know, standing, walking. Um, I, I, I love recommending compression. Um, definitely, it's difficult for, you know, year round use, I basically say, you know, use them when you can, but they can definitely keep the legs looking great and um, from developing signs of aging. Okay, so, um, Along the lines of being cognizant of the products that are available out there and the ingredients that are available out there for um, different uses on the skin, uh, I think it's important to be educated about these products that help soften thick or you know, calloused skin. And uh, the reason that's important is that sometimes they can be a little irritating, just like you know the retinols. So um, be deliberate about what you're applying. The, you know, my favorite ingredient is something called urea, which is a humectant, meaning it draws water into that dry skin and helps it um, stay hydrated. And then we also like lactic acid, which is a gentle exfoliant. And I'll talk a little bit more about acids and chemical peels in a little bit. But um, what's good about lactic acid being a gentle exfoliant is that you don't want to create like deep cracks or cuts. Sometimes I find patients trying to soften up their skin and they're applying products that are too um, aggressive. And then they end up, you know, with cuts and fissures and um, it can be painful. So these are two ingredients that I really like. Um, you put them on at night, you cover with socks or, um, you know, depending on the body part that you're trying to soften. Um, and what's important also to know is to sun protect. So the lactic acid can make the skin a little more sensitive to the sun. So again, depending on what part of the body you're treating, you should be cognizant of that. Eucerin just came out with, this is one of my favorites, um, this product, uh, this is their line for roughness relief. Um, but their spot treatment is great because, you know, historically we used to prescribe 40% urea and um, it's harder to find these days. This roughness relief spot treatment product is a 30% urea product, so it's close enough. And um, with diligent use, it can work really, really well. Okay, I um, like I said, I was gonna talk a little bit about chemical peels and exfoliation, and these are um, you know, products for use at home. Uh, the important thing to know here is that nine times out of 10, um, you know, as dermatologists, we prefer chemical exfoliation to mechanical exfoliation. So, you know, harsh, rough scrubs with lots of grains in them, um, you know, which mechanically remove dead skin cells, usually do so too aggressively. Um, and, and I definitely prefer the chemical exfoliation process um, better. So these are basically the acids. It is important to choose the products that's right for your skin type, whether it be sensitive or acne prone, um, dry, and we don't use these every day. So um, with the exception of salicylic acid for acne, for the most part, these should be used maybe once or twice a week, you know, pick two days a week that are not consecutive um, or maybe once a week. I tell my patients to think of it as their, you know, their spa treatment, once a week spa treatment for their skin. 
um, and that's how your skin can tolerate it. And you know, it has time to recover before they get used again. So here are the most common. Um, there's you know, a couple other new ones out there now, but these tend to be the most common um, that are readily available. Um, glycolic acid is a big workhorse. So we love glycolic acid. Um, it's great for normal skin or combination skin. Um, what's great about glycolic acid is that it, you know, it works a little bit on pigment as well. Um, and um, it's, it's sort of an, a, a, a great um, all over product. Um, salicylic acid is very, um, common, many people will recognize it from drugstore products that are used to treat acne. And the, it's actually great for oily or acne prone skin. And that's because it really loves the hair follicle. So it goes, it's, you know, it goes deep into the hair follicle where acne um, begins. And, um, but it's a little too strong for, uh, you know, skin that's a little bit more dry. So for, for dry skin, that's, that's very sensitive. You know, we, we, we like lactic acid, um, for skin that's even more sensitive, mandelic acid is great because it's gentle, doesn't really cause a lot of irritation. And the um, well-known acid that works on hyperpigmentation is azelaic acid. So if you have concerns about dark spots on the face, or if you are prone to say getting dark spots after you have a pimple and it heals, it leaves a dark spot, azelaic acid is great. Um, for you know, exfoliation and also working on that hyperpigmentation. And again, there's so many products out there in terms of, you know, sometimes I get asked which product, but it's really about looking at the ingredients, making sure you're not doubling up, making sure your cleanser doesn't have, you know, salicylic, and then you're also throwing glycolic on there, or maybe on the day you wanna do a glycolic acid product, don't use a cleanser with salicylic acid, sort of just be cognizant, be deliberate of what you're using. I rarely recommend specific products, but I'm sort of excited that CeraVe just came out with a new product that has gotten some really good reviews. Um, it's, a, it's a blend of glycolic and lactic acids, which I think is great. It also has the moisturizers that CeraVe is so known for. So um, I think this is going to be a gentle product. Again, they, 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 you know, they talk about using it nightly. I never recommend starting nightly up front, um, sort of easing your way in. Um, and, um, and then seeing how your skin responds. Okay. And this is my last, you know, number 10 tip. Uh, which is the hardest one, I think. I truly think this is the hardest one that, um, you know, it's hard for all of us to commit to, especially in this day and age. But that whole, you know, saying about getting your beauty sleep is absolutely 100% true. Um, we know that repair occurs during sleep. So our cells, um, you know, repair themselves as we sleep. When we don't sleep, we get more stress hormones. And these stress hormones are what cause inflammation in the skin. And that, then that inflammation causes breakdown of collagen and hyaluronic acid, which are you know, what leads to then having fine lines and wrinkles. It is also obviously true that dark circles and under eye swelling is tied to less sleep. And this can be a chronic issue. So it's of course, even one night, one good night of sleep can make your dark circles look better, but it's about maintaining um, because maintaining that uh, commitment because the dark circles um, do worsen over time. So the more sort of inflammation you have there, um, the more hyperpigmentation develops and then persists more and more. Um, so it, it's sort of, you know, definitely it's challenging, like I said, in, in, in this day and age, but it's, um, but it's if, if, if we can commit to it, um, it can be very helpful. Okay, this is just to show you all that I practice what I preach and that my children do as well. Um, we wear long sleeves, we wear hats, um, you know, we wear rash guards um, and obviously tons of sunscreen um, as evidenced by my ghost-like daughter right here. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm sorry about the sound issue in the beginning. If I can clarify anything that was um, unclear in the beginning, I'm happy to do that. 
Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Seplansky. So um, there's a few questions here. Um, one of them is, since you recommended um, SPF 30 um, as a sunscreen, um, the question is, if anything above 30, is, is it really more effective? Sure. So I think, um, so what I, what I mentioned in, um, in that original slide was actually 30 and up. So um, historically, many, many sunscreens, you know, especially like daily moisturizers with sunscreen had an SPF of 15 or maybe 20. Um, and um, now most of the daily moisturizers with sunscreen have 30. Um, up to 50 is 100% better. So I do think that 50 is better than 30. And there are some studies that show that the, you know, the 70s and the hundreds are better as well. I will say this, I, I, I do believe in wearing the highest number that you're willing to tolerate because we're human and we are not perfect. So um, really the number that's on the bottle is only that number. If you apply it on the dot every two hours, you know, when you're outdoors and a nice thick layer all over and don't miss any spots. So I think the reality is, is that most of us are not so perfect about doing that. So I really, for the most part, will wear the highest number that I'm willing to tolerate for any given activity. Of course, for daily use, you know, on the face, I wear a 50. Um, but that is also because there's just, there's products out there that are so cosmetically comfortable now that it's really no different to put on 30 versus 50. So you might as well. So what, what about, I most of the time it says every two hours, et cetera. From, but what's realistically for working people? Um, sure. Is it just putting it on before their makeup or do they absolutely have to reapply midday or? Right, that's a good question. And um, you know, the, my, my answer to that is that, you know, of course we have to, we have to live our lives. We have to, um, we have to, you know, everything is about risk benefit. So I think, you know, putting it on in the morning before you leave the house and go to work is important. Most people are driving to work, um, getting a little sun that way. I think unless you are going to be, you know, sitting outdoors for like, you know, 30 minutes to an hour having lunch during the summer, then you don't really have to reapply it. I will say that during the summer, some patients will tell me, oh, I go to work, I'm in the office all day, I come home and it's five o'clock and I go walk the dog for an hour. Um, you know, they're probably getting some sun and I think it's reasonable to throw on a little sunscreen. It's, it's more about just sort of being deliberate about which, act, you know, what, what activities are you doing and, and what kind of exposure you're actually getting on a daily basis. For somebody who's really like in the office all day, you know, goes home, it's dark out, I think throwing it on in the morning is reasonable. Thank you. So there's a few questions along the same lines and it's about um, with the number of products out there, how do they know what to put on first? Like how do you layer? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so, so there are, there's, there's lots of, you know, regimens out there and acronyms for sort of the order in which you should apply everything. And, um, and people are different. Some, some of my patients like simple regimens, some of them like the 12 steps, you know? Um, so the, the most important thing is that in the morning, an antioxidant goes on first and the sunscreen goes on last. In the evening, retinol or retinoid goes on first. And then usually you need to layer some sort of moisturizer on after that because um, they can be a little bit irritating. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, I think that is sort of the simple, um, the simple answer to that. The most important thing in the morning is that your sunscreen goes on last. And then in the, in the evening is to moisturize sort of at the end after you've applied, you know, your retinol. And if you have any other actives you want to be applying, um, then you moisturize, um, you know, afterwards to make sure that the skin doesn't get irritated from the actives. Thank you. Um, so does that, what about the serums when it comes to that? 
Sure. So um, I know that serums are very trendy now. And um, a serum in and of itself is really just a different vehicle for an active ingredient. Um, what's important about the serums is um, the ingredients. So if you're putting on a serum in the morning that has vitamin C, then that obviously goes on first and you wait for it to soak in and then you'll be able to put on your moisturizer with sunscreen after. In the evening, um, it's sort of physically impossible to apply a serum over a moisturizer. So unless the serum is the moisturizer, like a hyaluronic acid serum or something like that, then most likely the serum goes on first and then you apply you know, sort of a heavier moisturizer on after. Um, the serum in and of itself doesn't do much. Uh, I, I, I think it's just sort of become a trendy vehicle for different ingredients. Um, so, 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 so I think the key is more about being deliberate about the ingredients you're putting on your skin and not so much, you know, how you're getting them there. Okay. Um, there's a question about uh, daily face cleansing. Um, what your recommendation is for cleaning the face. What was the question? Daily? Uh, daily facial cleansing. Facial cleansing. Yes. So, um, sure. So for the most part, um, I recommend gentle cleansers. Um, you know, gentle foaming cleansers are usually um, useful if you have a little bit of oily skin. Um, usually as the skin matures and you lose some of that, you know, lubrication, some people like to, you know, use cream-based cleansers, um, but for the most part, I like for the cleansers to just, you know, be gentle, either be foaming or cream and not have actives in them. So um, that, that allows for application of actives separately. So does that, there's, there's a lot of micellar water that people mm -hmm. are using as cleansers, mm -hmm. but it has glycerin. Is that safe for cleansing? I think that I think that is that would be safe for cleansing as long as somebody doesn't have, um, say, acne on the skin. So that's oh. that's I'm sure that that's fine for say like a more mature skin that doesn't have so much you know oil that needs to be removed. Sure. Perfect. Um, there's a question also about eye cream, you know, a lot of times there's moisturizers and then they're selling eye, eye creams as well. Is it definitely necessary to use eye creams or can you just use your moisturizer for that sensitive area? Sure. Um, so unless the moist, unless the product has an active in it that could be potentially irritating, then you can use anything you can put on your face, you can put around the eyes. I, I, I believe for the most part that the eye cream is, you know, just a way to sell you a separate product. I think that your same moisturizer with sunscreen can go on that area. Moisturizer at night can go on that area. Even the retinols and the, the vitamin C for sure can go on that area. You know, even the retinols that we're, you know, expecting to exfoliate the skin a little bit, um, can go in that area, just maybe a little less frequently. So say if somebody can tolerate the retinol all over, you know, once or twice a week, maybe they only put it around the eyes once a week. Um, but you can definitely use the same exact product. Thank you. Um, there's a question about dark circles under the eyes. You mentioned that sleep definitely helps with that. But even with good sleep, is there anything else that could correct it? So there is, there's dark circles around the eyes are really multifactorial. Sometimes I will have a patient who has dark circles and, you know, they really can't get rid of them and I'll send them to the allergist and the allergist will say, Hey, you need to be on a daily antihistamine for your allergies. And then their dark circles will get better. So, you know, there's, there's different components of what can cause dark circles. Um, you know, things like lack of sleep things like, you know, potentially seasonal allergies, volume loss under the eye. So sometimes, you know, as we mature, we lose um, fat under the eye and that caused the skin to be more transparent. So for example, any of those things are not gonna respond to a topical cream. 
what topical creams can do for the skin, uh, you know, under the eyes is treat any hyperpigmentation. So, um, you know, we, they can stimulate a little bit of um, collagen production, but also, you know, even out a little bit of the hyperpigmentation that happens, um, you know, I, like I said, with the chronic rubbing of the eyes and the allergies and all that sort of thing. Um, the same retinols and exfoliants that we talked about before, just used in a deliberately gentle fashion. Right. There is um, along those lines, there's a question about um, what to apply to dark spots. So dark spots, um, there's, there's basically two types of dark spots that happen on the face. I'm assuming that we're talking mainly um, on the face. And um, there's basically two types. There's spots that happen after there's been inflammation in the skin. So you get a pimple or an irritation. And then as it heals, it leaves a little bit of a dark spot that is not true scarring. It's just what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And that eventually fades away with time and good sun protection. Applying to the individual spot topically, um, you know, you can use things like um, azelaic acid, which absolutely you can use on individual spots or um, if you have more than one spot, you can apply it, kind of like mix it with a moisturizer and use it all over the skin. The other type of dark spot on the skin is something called melasma on the face where, you know, um, usually women, but also men, by the way, can get melasma and they're sort of larger, darker patches that are hormonally related and from the sun and Frequently, those patches will require um, more of a bleaching cream. Um, something like azelaic acid might not get to that. So you'll need something with hydroquinone. And hydroquinone is an, an ingredient that needs to be used super carefully. So there's some versions of hydroquinone that are available over the counter. For the most part, I would recommend, you know, using those under the care of a dermatologist. Um, there, there is a question about um, what do you think about shaving facial hair? I would think it must be for, you know, a woman um, asking this question. So facial sure. hair shaving and also sure. what you would recommend to prevent ingrown hairs on the face as well. So, um, so two things, number one, shaving the facial hair became popular a couple of years ago where people were actually um, removing all of the peach fuzz on their skin. And then, you know, having this like, oh, my skin feels so wonderful and smooth. And I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that and, and unless, you know, you tend to get ingrown hairs when you do that. But um, I do think that the reason people's skin felt great afterwards is because they were also exfoliating all the dead skin cells away. So I don't necessarily, I, I didn't necessarily see the benefit of people removing all their peach fuzz. That being said, there's no harm. That whole concept that if you shave a hair, it will grow back thicker is absolutely not true. When you shave the hair, you are not doing anything to the hair follicle, um, which is, you know, wh wh where the cell is born. So uh, where the hair is born. So, um, really, I, you know, I think it's okay if somebody enjoys it. Do I think there's great benefit to shaving the, the hair on the face? Um, unless it's darker terminal hairs that, you know, people are worried about. And if that's the case, then I think it's totally fine. Um, in terms of ingrown hairs, I'll say this. Um, most of my patients who I find who end up with frequent ingrown hairs on the face, it is because they go to town on them. And I am guilty of this as well. We are all, um, for the most part, you know, guilty of picking at our skin too much, scratching, you know, that that sort of thing. And, um, you know, and and if you are recurrently plucking the same hairs over and over again, then um, definitely you can cause scarring. Um, sometimes people use tools that are not clean. Um, you know, if you're using, you know, the same tweezers over and over again, and they're touching the skin and you're digging, that can be, you know, um, not a great idea. I, I know it sounds a little strange, but if people have one or, you know, like one or two or a few hairs that they don't like on their face, I recommend 
trimming the hair. So you can, you know, cut the hair, you know, very short at the surface and sort of get the same benefit of not having a long hair on the face um, without, without the trauma of pulling it out from the bulb. Um, and then beyond that, it really depends on what someone's concern is. Laser hair removal, electrolysis, there's all sorts of, you know, possible treatments out there for um, unwanted facial hair. Um, you had recommended in your presentation for varicosities, um, compression stockings, compression socks. Mm -hmm. Is there um, would is there a difference between wearing a thigh high versus a knee high? And the other thing is, how do you prevent ingrown hair if you're wearing that every day? Um, so. So definitely thigh highs are better than knee highs. I find that extremely challenging for most people. It depends. It depends on um, what somebody's activities are, what kind of work somebody's doing. If somebody is physically standing all day long and can tolerate thigh highs, then sure, I would definitely recommend that. Um, I personally am on my feet a lot all day long. So um, I wear the knee high compression stockings because that's what I'm you know, most willing to tolerate. Um, as I keep saying, everything is you know, risk benefit and a balance between like living your life and doing your best to you know, stay healthy and keep your skin looking its best. So most people are willing to tolerate the knee highs. And it's really popular now to wear compression stockings because lots of um, athletes have started wearing them and um, all of this sort of interest in compression has really made it so that there's lots of products available that are reasonable, not ugly, good materials. It's not the same as the old, you know, pantyhose looking compression stockings um, from the past. The issue about ingrown hairs with the compression, I have honestly never been asked before. I would probably recommend that somebody look for, um, you know, a product that isn't purely, um, you know, elastic. And like I was just saying that, you know, it used to be that compression stockings were kind of that old school pantyhose type material that had lots of nylon in it. Nowadays, you can find ones that are almost just like an athletic sock, um, but that has that good compression in it. There's dress socks that have compression. Um, of course, there's all kinds of patterns and you know colors. And, and I would also say it's super important to make sure you get the right size. So when you order compression stockings or buy them, you need to find not just how tight they're going to be, and there's a measure for that, um, but what your size is. So there's two things you have to pick when you're buying them. You know, what are you a small, medium, large, extra large, or, and, excuse me, um, you know, how tight do you want the gradient to be? Yeah, and we measure that in millimeters of mercury. So eight to 15, 15 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. So, you know, I always recommend starting, starting slow and seeing what you can tolerate and, you know, Possibly that ingrown hair issue can also be mitigated by not, not wearing something that's too tight. Um, there's a question about micro needling for skin tightness under the eyes to produce collagen. Sure. So um, micro needling has had some great, great evidence behind it. Um, it's not a procedure that, um, that I do. Um, at Valley, we don't have, um, you know, devices that we use in, in our practice, um, but definitely um, there's, there's, good, there's good evidence behind microneedling. Absolutely. I, I'm assuming we're talking about microneedling that is done, I'm sorry, um, by a device that's used in, you know, like a dermatologist's office. I am very wary of the over-the-counter microneedling products because um, there's no way that people at home can sterilize them appropriately. So you can imagine that, you know, if somebody has a little cut or scrape and possibly some bacteria, they could potentially spread that, you know, everywhere on their face and get, you know, a pretty serious infection. So I, I, I tend to recommend leaving that to the professionals. Um, there's a few questions about using oil, um, any kinds of oil, almond oil in the face, coconut oil in the skin. Um, there's even a question about actually using 
orange oil from orange peels or green tea on your face for antioxidants. Okay, so um, I think my answer, okay, so it's a two part question. Number one, there are some good, some, some good um, reports for using coconut oil as a, um, you know, I, I, I want to, I'm going to use the word moisturizer, but but it's not really a moisturizer. What coconut oil does is it kind of locks in your own moisture. So it's not the same as a moisturizer that like gets into the layers of the skin and replenishes the, the moisture that the skin has. It forms a barrier basically. Um, that being said, there's studies, for example, um, young children with eczema, coconut oil can be great to like moisturize their skin and help them retain their own moisture and minimize flares. Um, the other question about things like almond oil for moisturizing the face, um, you know, most of that is going to do the same thing, sort of like lock in your own moisture. Uh, it would, we would have to like consider the individual ingredients of, you know, if there's anything in the oils that um, is considered an active that would be, you know, having any effect on the face. Um, the, the, the biggest thing with oils on the face is that as long as you are not acne prone, it's okay to use them. In the morning, if you're gonna use them, you need a sunscreen over it. And at night, you obviously don't need an additional moisturizer. Oils themselves have what's called a comedogenicity rating. So you can go online and look for, you know, a list of oils and it, it will literally rate them on how likely they are to clog pores and cause an issue, you know, in terms of acne, folliculitis, that sort of thing. So I think I answered part of that question. Yeah. Um, orange peels. And orange peels. Yeah. So the antioxidants, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, the caveat to using at home sort of um, remedies is that I have definitely seen people do harm to themselves attempting to use, for example, apple, apple cider vinegar to cure a wart or remove a skin tag or whatnot. Um, the, 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 that is my biggest concern about using something that didn't come, you know, in a bottle that's got a label on it in terms of how, you know, how much vitamin C is in here, how much acid is in here. Um, so, it, you know, I, I think I would say proceed with caution. We, I, I, we of course wouldn't have any evidence. There's no way to do studies in terms of like putting orange oil or that sort of thing on the face. As long as it's not, you know, harmful, then um, obviously I think it's okay. Um, but I can't comment on how effective it would be because we don't know exactly what's going on there. The antioxidants in the tea bags of green tea, um, you know, that may, that, that, may actually be um, effective. Um, I, I would just say it depends on, you know, where you want to place your energy <laughs> in terms of like applying, you know, the, 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 it, it might, it, in my head, it's a little easier to just buy a product that's got the antioxidant you want and put it on. Um, so everybody's different. And I think that, um, as long, again, with the tea bags, as long as it's not doing harm, then I think it would be okay. Um, we have a lot more, a few more questions um, that we could probably um, get to. How do you get rid of age spots on the hands and would porcelina help? Um, um, I'm not familiar with that product. Familiar with it either. Um, por uh, porcelina. But I guess just general dark spots on the hands. Sure. So, so dark spot. So I'll say this dark spots on the hands, hands in general, in terms of anti-aging are, um, the most challenging area to treat. And the reason for that is that, you know, we drive, um, you know, and frequently for the most part, um, and we, you know, get sun on our hands all the time, every day. So it's the hardest, and then we wash our hands throughout the day. So it's the hardest area to really sun protect. Um, so, um, you know, anything you put on your face, you can also put on your hands, but any effort that you do to get rid of dark spots on the hands, just know that if you're gonna put that effort in, then you also have to be super aggressive about sun protection. 
And, you know, sometimes people do decide to spend maybe some money or energy on, um, you know, chemical peels or lasers and those types of things, which can be done to very effectively remove the dark spots. Um, anything that you do, you then have to sort of be super aggressive about sun protecting. And um, some of my dermatology colleagues uh, do that and they are dedicated to doing that. And then they wear driving gloves. They will not drive. They will not put their hands on a steering wheel without having UPF 50 rated gloves on their hands. And that's because of, you know, the effort it takes to get them looking so good. So um, that's sort of uh, the, you know, the long answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions, maybe. Sure. Um, uh, one of the questions, what can you use on crepey skin? I know there was a lot of questions too about, you know, moisturizers, and I think you had a slide on that as well. Sure. So crepey skin is, um, is really challenging to treat with topical products. Um, moisturizers in general can help the skin temporarily look better. So, and moisturizers with hyaluronic acid can be helpful, or even just thick, heavy duty moisturizers will temporarily, you know, help the skin look more plump. Of course, you have to maintain that and keep it up um, if you want, you know, to have the continued result. Um, in theory, retinols can be used but it's very challenging to use retinols over such a large surface area. Um, and they can be more irritating off the face than, you know, than on the face. So I, I almost never recommend retinols on, on, on the body. Um, for, for somebody that has certain crepey areas that are really bothersome, um, there are devices, you know, lasers, uh, ultrasounds, microneedling, et cetera, that can be used to improve the appearance of, of crepey skin. Um, I think this might be our last question. Um, this question is about getting um, burned from a mental path patch from muscle relief. I guess mm -hmm. what's good to heal the skin after different types of burns. Sure. So, um, so a burn from a menthol patch. Um, it, I, I would say that that's um, it's a little bit of a difficult question because we don't know if, you know, was it, was it a burn? Was it a, um, like an allergic reaction, like a contact dermatitis to some ingredient that's in the patch or to the menthol itself? Um, in general, if, you know, if something's itchy, um, you know, that there could be an allergic reaction going on. And so therefore, you know, you might need like some hydrocortisone cream or even something stronger um, prescribed by, you know, a physician um, or, uh, you know, to, to clear that up first. And then in terms of healing, I would say, you know, the same um, things I recommended, like just plain Vaseline, keeping things, you know, moist and mushy and then sun protection. So sun protection during the day and Vaseline at night. And I'll say that, you know, if you have an area that's healing and the skin is sensitive, then focusing on the mineral sunscreens um, it, it is going to be less irritating than the chemical sunscreens. Thank you so much, Dr.